people are stupid. Live to tape. <laughs> Welcome to Millennial Season 4, Episode 30. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. I'm Pamela. And we are joined by one of our listeners this week. Actually, the first time we're having a listener on as part of our new Patreon benefits. Roshni, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. It's nice it's to have exciting. you. Nice to have you on. We have some fun stuff to discuss with you today. Uh, but first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you live? Where do you grow up? How long you've been listening to Millennial, stuff like that. What do you do? Um, so I live in Schenectady, New York, which is near Albany. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, though, so I'm a Jersey girl, just like you, Andrew. Oh. <laughs> um, I work at a museum. I'm a, a science festival manager. So we have an annual event called the Science Festival, and I pretty much coordinate it. So that's um, what I do. Cool. That's that's fun to work at a museum, it sounds like. Do you enjoy that? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It depends on the museum. I think all museums are crazy um, because they're yeah. nonprofits, and nonprofits are just uh, – it's always about money <laughs> and yeah. not having enough of it. And so, yeah. You know. Pledge, pledge, pledge. Give us more. Give us more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, it's it's nice to have you on, and we'll talk more with you today. Uh, of course, throughout the episode, but you also wanted to talk about Judeo Christian ideals, so we're going to discuss mm -hmm. that later in the show. And something that I'm really looking forward to doing over the course of having our listeners on is hearing what you disagree with us on. We got a little taste of that with uh, Parker a couple weeks ago. I think that's as uh, brutal as it's going to get, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> he was so nice brutal. about it, though. He was. He was. He was. It was hard to come up with something. I disagree with you guys. So, oh, mm, well, that's good. I, <laughs> that's good. I can tell you not everyone feels the same way, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know if how, if how good it is. I might just be perpetuating my echo chamber here. Ah, that's true. That's true. Find something to disagree with us on. So uh, we don't want to reinforce our beliefs. We want you to have your own as well. <laughs> so. Trying. So um, anyway, a, a few weeks ago, I guess a few months ago now, I offered everybody an update on my mental health <laughs> discussion we all <laughs> have spoken about here on the show. My, my saga goes back over a year now. I had this crippling anxiety, and it was some point I couldn't even go outside. I, I uh, got medicated. I got put on Lexapro. I started seeing a psychiatrist at the same time. Um, and then over the past six ish months, since I've kind of settled into a place here in Chicago and I've gotten my life a little more under control, I started going down on my Lexapro, which was the last update I had for everybody. And I was a little nervous about it because when you depend on 20 milligrams of Lexapro for a good year, I have my timeline a little messed up. This whole saga has lasted two years. So when, when you're on 20 milligrams of Lex, Lexapro for a whole year, it's scary to start going down because you feel like you depend on this. <laughs> you need this stuff to stay, stay steady. And so I did go down to 15, went fine, a little nerve wracking, but it went fine. And then I went down to 10 and same thing. It's like nerve wracking because I, I'm like, oh my God, I'm having less and less. Um, will, I have, will I have a panic attack and will this all go to shit? Um, but it went well, and now I'm down to five. And wow. We're, yeah, we're, we're going slow. My psychiatrist recommended that we move slow. She has said that's how she gets the best results. And maybe by the end of the year, I'll go off it completely because I think, as with anyone, um, as anyone feels, you don't want to be on medication if you don't have to. And I'm hoping that I don't have to. But at the same time, my psychiatrist is suggesting that I see a psychiatrist, uh, or sorry, a therapist, to develop some coping mechanisms, mechanisms in times of stress, which I want to do because I do want to get off the medicine, but I'm also like uh, seeing a new person. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm really happy to hear that that's been working for you. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's, been, it's been a cool accomplishment, something I never really anticipated before. 
But I also had something weird happen to me at the psychiatrist's office the last time I saw her. I walk in, and I didn't know this was going to be occurring. She's sitting there with an iPad next to her, and there's a video conference going on facing the couch where I am to sit. And she's like, oh, sorry, we should have told you about this before you came in, but I am I hired an outside outside company to start taking notes for me so I can focus on you while we're talking. And then on the iPad, there's two people. One person's in training. The other person, I guess, is the lead in taking the notes. But have any of you ever experienced that before where somebody hires outside help and they're sitting there via iPad listening, watching? No, definitely <laughs> not. I was shocked that she didn't think she needed to clear it with you until you got there. Right. It was weird. And like, I'm a little miffed about that, but I also wasn't about to start fighting with her because otherwise I do like her. That would make me really uncomfortable. <laughs> I can't imagine it. Yeah. And I'm sure it makes some people uncomfortable. Um, she did say that she had considered hiring somebody to actually sit in the office with her, but she wasn't comfortable with that. But I just feel like having a stranger in Florida watching us over our iPad is a little strange. <laughs> Yeah, well, because you didn't consent to that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unless you count like your tacit acceptance of it when you walked in the room and saw that you were really being given no other choice. Right. Oh, and, and by the way, it's a terrible angle. I mean, if, if I was a woman, it would be looking up my skirt. It's like that. It's like, you know, knee level facing right at me. And I'm sitting there like I'm trying to focus on her, but I'm looking at myself in the selfie cam and I'm like, oh, God. Turn this off. Turn this off. That would make me feel worse. Like, yeah. It's just not helping the self-esteem issues I came in here with. Right. So I thought I'd mention that. It is very strange. I wonder if it's like attorney-client privilege, where if there's someone else in the room, you know, it, you, there's no longer privilege. It's like doctor-patient privilege. Oh, well, someone else is listening, so no more privilege. Right. I'm sure it's not like that, but... <laughs> I also, I think I mentioned this before, the psychiatrist has a Deathly Hallows Always piece of <laughs> art in her office. And like the first time I walked in there, you're nervous when you meet a uh, psychiatrist for the first time. And seeing that just instantly comforted me like, yes, okay, she's a Harry Potter fan. I'm going to be cool with her. This is going to work. It's meant like, to be. Yeah. That is the best. Plus, you, it's just like, it's so hard to find a new person that you're like, is this really worth it for me to go for right. someone else? Yeah, I'm not going to go switching over my, uh, over how I look in the selfie camera and, you know, forgetting to bring this up to me. Like, whatever. She's been good otherwise. <laughs> what if I had a panic attack right there? She was the cause of the panic attack because I was looking at myself in the iPad. <laughs> how could you? <laughs> Um, anyway, I just wanted to also mention, like, this is a life thing. Uh, my parents recently, uh, went under contract on a new home, meaning our home of 22 years is about to be moved out of. And that's like such a crazy thing to think. Laura, Pam, did you two, what are your parents? Have they been in the house, the same house you grew up in? All your life or what? I mean, we moved when I was in middle school. So yes and no. Like, I don't have tons of young childhood memories in their current house. Um, but I don't think I'll feel weird when they decide to move. Because honestly, at this point, me and my brother ha are both grown. And the house is too big for them. Right. So I hope that they do move into something that's a better size for them. Right. And that's why my parents are are moving out too. But it's also like just sad. And my mom gets really sentimental. So I know there's going to be a lot of crying. And like now I don't want to go back to the house because they're they're going to have to get out of it in like two months. And I know all it's going to be is, oh, remember this memory? Remember that memory? Take a picture in your bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> my, like uh, my parents are divorced and my dad and my stepmom moved house a lot. And we were never with them like 50% of the time. So I have like no emotional ties to their place. But my mom, who had us like 99% of the time, she actually moved out of the childhood uh, townhouse we were raised in while I was in Los Angeles. And I wasn't able to go back before she moved. So they packed all my stuff, which was really weird because I never really got yeah. that 
like goodbye and and I wasn't able to go and like sort anything out. So it was probably for the best, but it is kind of like strange because when I went back, I went back to a completely new house that I had like never stepped foot yeah. in before because her and my brother were like the mm-hmm. ones going to all of the open houses to find a new place and stuff like that. But I think that because my grandparents would take care of us when we would get off of school when we were younger and I'm very close with them, when they moved house, that hit me the most because all of the holidays were spent at their house. So like, it's not the same fireplace and it's not the same dining room. And it's kind of one of those things where you always think that they're going to stay there because they're so old when you meet them, you know? (laughs) So that was a little bit weird and uh, it's emotional. I get it. I'm like your mom. I would just like cry over stupid shit. (laughs) Well, and I guess truthfully, I'm kind of afraid of going back and like getting all sentimental myself because like that's the, (laughs) that's the house where I started podcasting, where I probably realized I was gay, where like tons of memories, like graduating high school, middle school, elementary school, like made friends, lost friends, lost loved ones. Like it's just weird to think that this place that's always been your home, you won't be able to enter it. Also, I don't know where, like if your parents are just moving like to a smaller place in the same town, but when my mom moved, she moved out of our hometown and, um, and my hometown, which is a place called mill Valley, which is very close to San Francisco. It's also where Muir woods is located. So if you guys have ever been to Muir woods, that's mill Valley. It, um, it, it's always felt like my safe place. Like it's just this tiny little bubble, you know, And so Mm -hmm. just knowing that I don't go back and like sleep in that town anymore is really weird. And like that makes me emotional more so than the house, you know, because it's like the town that raised me. Like you can still go back and visit, but it's not the same. Yeah. No, I totally get that. But this also. um, So they were supposed to come out and visit me in September. My mom just flew out here with my aunt. We had a great time. But my mom and dad are supposed to drive out here in September. My dad visits less because he's afraid of flying. And this, as I think I've documented on the show, has caused him to never visit me at all. I moved out of the house 10 years ago this past May. It's been a decade. My father never visited me in my nine years in California. He has visited me now three nights in Chicago, meaning out of, out of the 10 years I've been out of the house, he's visited me a whopping three nights. And I just said to my mom earlier, I'm like, just re- they, they were like, oh, yeah, so we're going to have to postpone the trip uh, because of the move. And, of course, I understand that. But my dad hasn't been visiting me at all. He has a fuck ton of catching up to do. So, uh, you know, he needs to stop making excuses. He's retired. He's got nothing going on other than occasional volunteer stuff. Get his ass out here and start, you know, visiting your son again. I mean, now that I'm not out in California, it's time to start making that shit up. <sighs> Isn't he afraid of flying? Yeah. Yeah, so that's why they drive 12 hours. Makes my mom drive 12 hours. 12 hours is not bad, though. No excuse. He could take the train. He could... But, 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 like, the first time he came out here, he wasn't medicated. Drives out here. Realizes he can't stay out here because just, like, being in a new place just freaks him out. Leaves the next day after a 12-hour, two-day drive. Because they split it up over two days. With my mom. Anyway, this is a whole other thing I won't get into now, but it's just outrageous. What else is going on today, Laura? (laughs) So this is a little bit of a PSA. So uh, Monday, August 6th, the day that we recorded this show, marked the 53rd anniversary of the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So that's right. Within most of our parents' lifetimes, it was legal for states to require literacy tests and other ridiculous means as a prerequisite to voting that were used to discriminate against and disenfranchise racial minorities. So this is a millennial PSA here, a call to action. The best way for you to celebrate is to check your voter registration status and register if you have not already. We will provide a link for you to do that in our show notes. It's so easy to these days, too, yes. thanks to the internet. There's no excuses. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I just got my, my card, my polling place today for the primary. Yay! So, yeah. I'm nice. so excited. Like, yeah. genuinely excited to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would never not vote. <laughs> Good. Um, so before we move into 
a segment where we're going to call one of our listeners. And then following that, some news, we do have another update from one of our sponsors, BioClarity. This is a green, gentle skincare line that helps me get naturally glowing skin that is 100% vegan, gluten, and cruelty-free. My skin has seriously never been better. And I'm happy to report that I was able to retire a concealer that I was using to reduce redness in my skin thanks to BioClarity. What? Yeah. That's huge. I know. It's amazing. I've been using it on my cheeks for years because they get so red. Um. So the BioClarity's clear skin routine is for combination oily or breakout prone skin, and it's an easy three-step routine, just cleanse, treat, and restore. The routine contains nourishing plant extracts like chamomile, green tea, cucumber, licorice root, oat kernel, plus Floralux, which is derived from chlorophyll. BioClarity helps fight breakouts, soothe skin, minimize redness, reduce pore size, and even out skin tone. When I started using the clear skin routine, I saw results within the first two weeks, thanks to the Garden Lush ingredients. My favorite part of this routine is the hydrate step. This lightweight, non-greasy moisturizer is perfect for reducing redness and minimizing pore size. That's because BioClarity's unique ingredient, Floralux, is a clever form of chlorophyll, and it's proven for nourishing the skin and soothing away imperfections and blemishes. Floralux has antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties that feed your skin from the outside in. BioClarity is delivered straight to you and is an easy-to-use three-step skincare routine that will leave you with glowing skin. Get started on healthier habits with your skincare. Just go to BioClarity.com. Our listeners will get their first month for 50% off a routine, plus shipping is free. And it all comes with a 100% risk-free money-back guarantee. But you need to enter our code MIL. That's BioClarity.com and enter our code MIL. All right. Thank you, BioClarity. So we have a very active private group on Facebook that all of our listeners are welcome to be a part of. And people share their personal lives in there. And people look for advice and feedback and stuff. So it's it's just a really great community. And we heard recently from one of our listeners, Chris, I'm going to call her now. She made a post revealing that beginning actually this month she's going to start living in her car so we of course have a lot of questions about that and we wanted to uh ask her hello hey chris it's millennial hi hi there how you doing where where are we speaking to you from oh i am in uh east of seattle in a small town okay Cool. So, um, you know why we invited you on? You made a post in our group about starting to live out of your car. And a lot of people were like, wow. And a lot of people were like, what? And a lot of people were like, why? (laughs) So we want to answer all these questions. It's an interesting thing. And I, I think it is a very millennial type of decision because it does save money and it does grant you freedom. So I guess, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and then how you came to decide to do this? Sure. Um, So I've actually been working with, uh, I guess, professionally with dogs for the past 10 years. Um, In the pet industry, you generally accept that though your job is a lot of fun, you're not well paid. Um, And so I have struggled with um, getting a reasonable income for a long time. Um, and in addition to that, I love to travel. Um, I actually stumbled across the whole RV life uh, a few years ago, several years ago now, and immediately latched onto that as something that I wanted to do. Um, and obviously RVs themselves, you know, the big RVs, those cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so that wasn't feasible. And plus it's uh, hard to find a place to park. And eventually I kind of got used to the idea of just getting smaller and smaller until, you know, I, I decided I want to eventually move into a van that I've customized to look like an apartment. But for right now, the car is the next best thing. Yeah. And what is this car that yeah. you're moving into? What type? I have a Honda Element 2009. Okay, so and when are you? Has this already started? Or are you about to start? 
Oh, I am about to start. I am approximately a week out. Actually, this time next week, I will have spent my first full night in the car. Um, I've done a few test runs on vacation, but I've never actually lived in it for a long period of time. So that will be the first the first day, the beginning. Yeah. And yeah. I have the I have the bed and everything set up and a, a cooler and all that. So it's it's getting there. Yeah. Wow. So are you excited? Are you nervous? Like what's going through your head right now? Um, it's a little of both. I am mostly worried about finding a safe place to park. That's probably the the hardest part of living in your car. Uh, there are safe parking programs here, and I've been very, very blessed with extremely generous people who have offered their driveways or their front yards to me, uh, not on a, you know, constant basis, but occasionally, you know, bouncing around from place to place. So I guess that's where I'm most nervous, but mostly also I'm pretty excited. I think this is going to be a great adventure and I'm really looking forward to not paying rent. (laughs) Yeah. 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 It it does seem cool. I mean, I've always had the travel bug as well. So to, to some degrees, I'm, I am envious of this, the, the living on the road life. How how have your family members reacted to this? Because you <laughs> so, do mention you're you're a little nervous for your safety. Sure, yeah. My parents were initially uh, very nervous. I think about this, but they've kind of grasped. I think they've understood that my situation is that it's this or move back home, um, and they've accepted that. They are very supportive now. So I think they've, you know, I think I've also proven enough that I know what I'm doing. I have an idea of how to make this work and I'm not just jumping into this blind. You know, I've, I've done the research and I've figured out how I can make complicated things like going to the bathroom work, you know? Right. Well, so let's talk about that. Like stuff like that. How (laughs) do you do that? And then like showering, what's your plan there? Yeah. So uh, showering is one of the easier things. Um, You can join a gym. That's very popular. A lot of people will just pay gym membership and it's, you know, 30, 40 bucks a month. And that's where you just have your showers. Uh, I plan on, there's a community center here that I'm going to look into joining. They have the same idea. It's basically a gym. And then uh, as far as bathroom goes, you can either use public restrooms. Or um, I've actually invested in a little toilet that I'm going to put cat litter in, hilariously, uh, and use that. That, <laughs> yes. is, that is kind of funny. <laughs> so that is my cat litter toilet. I'm so excited. <laughs> it's so glamorous. But... Uh-huh. Um, from my Ubering days, I also have a hot tip for you. I have found McDonald's to be very reliable. When you're on the go, yes. you just need a bathroom. Absolutely. I'm loving it. Good By it, know. I mean the yep, bathrooms. Yep. <laughs> just don't even exactly. look at the front counter. Counter, I just beeline to the bathroom. No, you just run in. <laughs> <laughs> don't make eye contact. <laughs> yeah, and then run out. I wasn't here. And as we all know, Starbucks now is like, come in, use the bathroom. Doesn't but matter. But also, if they're Sleep still open, Target is great. Because they're right in front, and they're not yeah. going to judge you. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's right. They do have the bathrooms right in front. That's really nice. Yeah. I think also, and I don't know how ubiquitous these are in Washington, but um, at least out here on the East Coast, if you go to like a rest area, especially the ones that cater to truckers, those usually tend to have really nice like bathroom and shower facilities that you don't have to pay for, at least from what I've seen. Uh, So that might be a consideration. Rocking. Yes, the trucking ones. I believe it's usually about seven dollars a shower. Um, you do use, I, I To my knowledge, I believe you have to pay for those. I don't know if it varies from company to company or if truckers get a deal. Um, I have a friend who worked in trucking, and she said that she was about six or seven dollars a shower to pay for those. So that's a really good option if you're on the road and traveling. I have somewhat of an advantage of being um, stationary while I'm doing this. People who are living on the road do rely on truck stops a lot, though, to both sleep and shower. Yeah. How about sleeping? Sleeping and then sleeping... Com- well, I guess my question is sleeping comfortably. Like, what kind of setup do yeah. you have for that? Yeah. So I actually have two foam camping mats that I've cut into a very strange <laughs> configuration to fit around the dog crate I have in my car. Um, and those are pretty comfortable to sleep on. Uh, I actually sleep in a hammock right now. So I'm looking forward to getting the van where I can set up the hammock and have more room because 
during the day you just move the hammock out of the way and you've got the whole van then. Um, but while I'm on the element, I plan on sleeping on the camping mats and it's reasonably comfortable. I'm not going to pretend it's like a five star hotel, but it's, right. it's not bad either. Yeah. Okay. And then another yeah. question I had about like safety and all that is, are you concerned about high or low temperatures making you uncomfortable or potentially putting you in danger when it gets way too hot or cold? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm very lucky to be in Western Washington is what I'll say. Yeah. Uh, usually here our temperatures, I mean, they don't vary that much. It's generally between 65 and 70 degrees, especially oh. at night. We have cool nights, even in the summer, when it gets up to 80 in the summer during the day, at night, you can usually expect it to dip back down into that 65 range. And that's very comfortable for me. Yeah. Um, I do have things like sunshades to protect the car during the day, uh, using a lot of Reflectix, which is the reflective bubble wrap that you can buy for insulation. I use that as well um, to block out the sun from the windows and keep the car cool. And I mean, as I have pointed out to a few people, my car has air conditioning where I, my apartment does not. So, <laughs> I, yeah, right. There is that too. <laughs> and I guess like some days you might go and spend a few hours inside Starbucks or something, just like on your laptop, catching up on work. Definitely. Or yeah. I think especially during the rainy season here when it can be pretty claustrophobic even being in an apartment because all you want to do is go outside, it's going to be more important to go out and actually go into places because it's it's going to feel like I'm I'm actually living, you know, in this tiny space. Sure. But until then, you know, the whole world is your backyard. It's really freeing. <laughs> right. <laughs> how how long do you worried? think Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Roshni, we're going to say something. I, I was just wondering, are you worried about like crime or someone like trying to steal stuff in your car or like, like I know when I, I when I'm driving, I drive a lot and um, usually I take naps at the rest area, but I'm like too afraid to open my windows because I'm afraid that he's going like, to break into my car. Are you like afraid of that at all? Like, um, I mean, it is something to consider. I, it's always possible that somebody could, you know, whether I'm in here or not, break my windows, come after me, come after one of the dogs or, you know, steal my stuff. I guess I kind of consider that to be equally possible in an apartment because I live in an area where property crime is really high and break-ins and into apartments are, are not rare at all. I mean, we kind of expect it here. So yes. And also I, I you know, what do you do? You can't live in fear. So yeah. <laughs> I yeah. guess, yes, but you just kind of stay, stay aware, stay aware of your surroundings, park in places where you feel safe. The advantage is, you know, if I don't feel safe somewhere, I can just crawl into the front seat and leave. So, yeah, good point. True. I know a question that a few people had in the Facebook group was, how is this going to work with your dogs? And I was wondering I if you could talk about that a little bit, because <laughs> you had a pretty well thought out answer that you provided in the group. Yes. Uh, so I actually get that question probably the most, which I find kind of funny because I'm like, you're not worried about me. You're worried about the dogs, <laughs> but I would also ask the same question. So I don't blame anyone. Um, I, uh, so I actually do a lot with my dogs during the day. They come to work with me every day. Um, mm -hmm. I work at a vet, so they hang out usually in the kennel and they're used to it. That's their daily routine already. So I don't have to worry about them while I'm at work. If there's a time where I need to go somewhere and they can't come with me, there's doggy daycare. I've got friends in the area who are pet sitters, and I also have friends in the area who are just dog lovers, so I can leave the dogs with them. As far as exercising the dogs go, um, we go on hikes every weekend, and during the week, even in the mornings, I'll try to make a, a put in a hike. I live right next to a very beautiful spread of trails. So I'm not too worried about them getting enough exercise. You know, there's dog parks, there's um, uh, dog events. My dog, when, my one dog competes in dock diving. So on the weekends, we'll go to dock diving competitions and he gets to swim and have the time of his life. And by the end of the day, he's pretty tired. And I don't think he cares where he's sleeping after that. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Mm -hmm. I'm more worried about the people who are going to, you know, like call the cops on you because you left your dogs in the car. Uh, um, yeah, I worry friends. about that. <laughs> yeah, put up a sign. Yeah, <laughs> explain. I well, I do actually. I have a sign already that says, you know, the air conditioning has been running. The dogs are safe. Um, mostly, I plan to do shopping in the early morning when it's cooler out, or late at night. 
Um, if there's anywhere that I need to go and I can't bring the dogs with me, um, you know, just into a store, I don't plan on making it a long trip, just, mm. you know, run in, run out, make sure the temperature is not too warm. And I guess, you know, if, if worse comes to worse, I just have to pick up a friend to, to sit with them while I'm in the store. So, yeah. Yeah. How long, how long do you anticipate you'll do this for? Do you have an idea of that yet? Um, I think it can go one of two ways. So either this is going to be great and I'm going to love it. And at that point, I plan on buying a van, a cargo van, and doing a lot of work to it to put in electrical. I wanted to live off of the uh, off the grid and have a um, uh, sun, what do you call that, solar panel up top. And um, I was going to kind of retrofit that to be able to travel anywhere in the country and have electricity and running water and all of that, basically make a full RV out of a cargo van. That's mm. if this works out. If I hate it, which I've already come to terms with is perfectly okay. You know, I don't have to love it. I just have to try it. Um, if I end up hating it, then I will figure something else out. <laughs> but yeah. I imagine that would be, you know, I'd know within the month if, if it was something that just was not for me. Yeah. You, you've you clearly seen very, seemed very motivated to try and do this. And I, I can totally understand, like, you really feel the urge to try it because otherwise you'll never know. And if you did, exactly. this did not work out, you can still say, hey, I tried it. And that that's admirable mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you think you'll document this in some way? Like, <laughs> like are you going to do it like an Instagram or? <laughs> I wanted to do a YouTube. I'm very tempted. Uh, yeah. I just not really, I love video editing. Oh. I haven't really committed to it yet. I've started to try to film the process of, because part of living in your car and, and all of this is you have to get a storage unit to store your items. And I don't want to have to pay for a storage unit. The idea here is to save money and not spend more. So I'm actually trying to purge pretty much everything that I own to do this. Oh, wow. So I've tried to document me getting rid of everything that I've purchased. And it's amazing how many things I've collected over the years. I feel like it's actually been an incredible waste of money because of how much money I owe at this point, uh, which is part of the reason that I'm doing this. So, Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do want to document it. I think it's, I, th- I love the, the van life community. And I think, you know, it's always interesting to hear different perspectives from people who are getting into this. Yeah. Yeah. They, or it could make for a good book, like how you sold off everything and hit the road. Yep. And like, yes. <laughs> I've like kind of adventures. Yeah. I've kind of jokingly said this, but also I was kind of serious. Like I, when I left California, I sold off everything that could not fit in my car. If it was too, mm-hmm. if it couldn't fit in the car for my cross country trip, I hit the or I, I threw it out or I tried to sell it. And if I couldn't, I would throw it out. And it was it was kind of freeing. Um, and then I thought I would write a book because a lot of people live in L.A. and probably shouldn't. And I think they need a book, a, a guide to getting out of California and surviving. How to <laughs> I <feel> leave? Like <laughs> I, I yes. could help them there. I'll write them a self help book. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, I really well, hope I, you I, do something like a YouTube channel because I yeah. would follow you. Mm-hmm. That it just sounds oh, fascinating to me. Yeah. yeah, I I do hope to, and if I do, I will definitely post it in the millennial group. Um, I, I you know hope to have the time to do it. That's the only thing. But I think now that I'm no longer going to be cleaning an apartment, it's going to be easier to find a little free time. So <laughs> very true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And please keep us posted on how things are going. We, we'd we happily offer updates here because I'm sure some of our listeners will be curious, just like we are. And good yeah. week. Like you said, one week to go. So good luck. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We give you props for, for attempting this. This is definitely a, a very interesting and cool undertaking. So. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. it. For sure. For sure. Uh, and you're still going to be able to listen to podcasts, right? I will. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. I'll okay. have uh, internet access at uh, places with Wi-Fi. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's free everywhere <laughs> yeah. these days. <laughs> it is pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> park, park in front that of my place sometime. I'll give you the Wi-Fi password and I'll let you okay. stay here too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Can you mad- imagine if I was just like, yeah, come to my place. I'll let you have the Wi-Fi didn't password. Let her didn't come let her stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of yeah. rude. Um, that is so cool. Yeah. I I don't know. I just have so much admiration for Chris. 
Yeah. And I can't help but think, Andrew, moving into your car could solve your drain problems. <laughs> That's true. It's something I <laughs> could go discussed clog in up other it people's today. drains and public areas. Exactly. <laughs> right. right. So I'm a, oh, I've, I've, I've done that before where I clog a toilet and I just <laughs> oh run out God. before anybody knows. Oh, I remember. <laughs> I remember that happening once when we were in a hotel. Oh, oh my God. yep. It's happened in hotels too. But I, there have been times where I called, but it's so embarrassing because they come up with the plunger and God, yeah. you're sitting there with shame. <laughs> Sorry, my poop was too big. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the one reason I wanted to have her on is because it's a very unique situation and and I think a lot of listeners and, of course, we were compelled by our story. So. Yeah, it's really interesting because I feel like it's there's more um, like shame surrounding this idea now but like my mom grew up in the 70s and 80s where this was like perfectly acceptable because it was the tail end of the hippie movement especially out in san francisco too Mm. like she talks all the time about how they would see families every summer that like lived on a school bus and like they just drove the school bus around and turned the school bus into a home so it's it's kind of funny how it's like socially unacceptable now but there was a time in america when this was perfectly fine so but that could change with people looking right. to save money and yeah. I think people well, look tiny for houses adventures are a thing. like Maybe this. Maybe tiny cars are next. Yeah. yeah. My um my great aunt and uncle did this. I mean, of course, th- they actually got an RV, um, like a relatively small, modest RV, but they lived out of that for a year and a half hmm. and just drove all around the country staying at parks and truck stops and even like walmart parking lots because you can actually park there overnight you can still do that um yeah Hmm. yeah Yeah. so it's it's a super cool thing and i think it takes a really unique personality to be able to pull it off i know i probably wouldn't be able to but i am so fascinated by it and i i hope that we can call chris in the future to get more updates yeah i'm hoping so too i'd love to hear how this goes I want to know how she's fitting her clothes into her car because I don't think my clothes could fit into my car. Like that would all, that's all that would be in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I don't maybe put a bag on the top. Like that's what I did with my clothes. I put them all on the top, but I, but it was only for a couple of weeks. So I don't know. Anyway, Roshni, we're going to turn our attention to you in a moment. But first, it's time to tell everybody about our next sponsor. They are Beachbody On Demand. They're an easy-to-use streaming service that gives you instant access to a ton of super effective workouts that you can do from the comfort of your living room 24-7. We've spoken about them before. All the well-known workouts like P90X, Insanity, 21 Day Fix, Payo, 3-Week Yoga Retreat are all on here. This is, this is the company with the best workouts. And the key to Beachbody being so amazing is that it lets you work out where you want and when you want thanks to their apps. They're compatible with all your smart devices like your tablet, your phone, your computer, your smart TV. Whichever device you have near you, you can use that to work out. My personal favorite workout program is UV2. I've mentioned this guy before. He is so he's so much fun to dance with. It's a great starter workout. I want everybody to try Beachbody and when, once you sign up, go to UV2. You're going to love it. Get out, get in a little dance workout. It's funny. I had my mom and aunt visiting last week, and I learned that my aunt uses Beachbody On Demand too. And we got into a passionate discussion about it because she uses it for the same reasons that I rave about. She's a mom who works a job. She doesn't have time to go to the gym after work. Who wants to do that? And this is where Beachbody comes in. She can work out at home without taking another trip out. Another reason she loves it, it's freaking $8 a month when you commit to a year up front. That's cheaper than any gym. And another reason she loves it, it works. I'm not going to comment on my aunt's physical appearance, but I will say that I asked her if it works, and she said, hell yeah. And funnily enough, we were talking about this as we were walking out of a deep dish pizza place. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, um, I want everybody to try it. Right now, our listeners can get a special free trial membership when you text MIL to 303030. Again, that's MIL to 303030. You will get full access to this entire platform for free. All the workouts, all the nutrition information and support, totally free. It's so easy to sign up. Text MIL to 303030. Thank you, Beachbody. Okay, so Roshni, hello again. Hello. <laughs> 
Um, something you wanted to talk about on the show today are Judeo-Christian ideals. You believe that these ideals are impacting society and our laws. Um, and we thought this was an interesting discussion, so we wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Can you first explain the term Judeo-Christian to us? Sure. So the term itself is actually fraught with a lot of its own issues. It was first appeared in, in 1939. Um, it, it generally means a value system common to Judaism and Christianity. Uh, but the reason why it was so sort of became a thing, because it, remember there was a lot of anti-Semitism previously, is that they, you know the politicians really wanted to unite America against this sort of communist atheism. So by including uh, the Jewish people, they could extend this sort of Western hegemony over the non-religious Soviet Union. So it, it's come to mean a value system common to, um, to J- Judaism and Christianity, but it's also, um, it, it may be more of a term in use than in practice. What, what are some examples of it impacting society and our laws? I would say that, look, one of the things you know, might notice in most in is abortion. Uh, the, a lot of the, the pro-life debate is about the, when, when is the conception of life, this conception of life, when, um, when, when, it's a, when a, it, the baby is a fetus or an act of birth. And the idea of the conception of life being a fetus is a Christian idea. And so um, we saw this with, with Parker, where... Um, you know, not to throw shade at parking or anything, but, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things he said was that I believe that life starts at conception and life is precious. And so I don't argue with that. Yeah, that's, that's cool, but that shouldn't, but why should that matter to our laws? So that's my question. So in, in the debate over abortion, why should that be important? If America is truly a secular democracy, which it's, not actually, but if it's supposed to be a secular democracy, then why, why does anything that's in the Christian or Judeo-Christian value system acceptable as an argument for a law? Um, you see also with uh, gay rights, uh, you know, the Bible says, you see that a lot, the Bible says marriage is between a man and a woman. You know, homosexuality has existed since you know, forever. <laughs> and so why should the laws, why should I be held as a non, uh, non-Jewish person or non-Christian person? Why should I be held to these ideas and values of, of this religion when I'm living in a supposedly secular country? And then another thing that, um, this, um the support of Israel, uh, in the country, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of support for Israel has to do with, People say they're the chosen people. They belong there. It's from the Bible, and because it's in the Bible, that's what it needs to. Uh, that's what it needs to be. So, you know, that's the rash. That's that's one of the rationales that you'll hear for for the creation and the continued support of, of Israel. So, to play devil's advocate here. Uh, Christianity is the largest religion in the U.S. So if if I'm coming to you as a Christian and I'm like, because we are the largest religion in the U.S., what <laughs> what would you <laughs> sorry what, what would you say to that? What what would you say to somebody who uh, you know is trying to argue that point that we're the biggest, so it should be our way? I mean, well, but then why make America a secular democracy? If you don't want, why put that in the Constitution, you know, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof? Why put that in there if Mm -hmm. you want to run the the country through Judeo-Christian values? And, and, And the other thing is, if we all de facto, you know, accept it, that de facto we're a Christian country, then how do we justify going to places like Afghanistan, places where we say, well, they're a theocracy and, and that just doesn't work. Right. We're essentially a theocracy. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, there's a, there's a uh, hypocrisy there where we can, you can go and spread democracy to all of these uh, other places, but you know, we don't really have it here. So, 
Yeah, I think the whole discussion boils down to people not being able to separate that idea of God and country, um, especially folks who have been raised to believe that our founding fathers were deeply religious. Most of them weren't. Um, and I think that it's being unable to recognize that while U.S. law might have some commonalities with Christian doctrine, like i.e. don't murder people, it doesn't necessarily mean that U.S. law is or should be informed by Christian doctrines. Right. I definitely think that works. And there's also, um, there's a, there, there, there's a problem with putting one religion, uh, you know, above another, where you're saying this is the right religion because you're, you're othering everyone else. And in, you know, in doing that, you're, you're saying that they don't, they're, they're inferior, you know, in a way, because, uh, Sorry, because, you know, because they're, they're not the right religion. They don't follow the same right, correct moral code. So they're inferior. And that's, you know, a very dangerous, um, you know, a very dangerous place to be. Mm-hmm. If, especially if you're not, if you're another. <laughs> Interestingly, yeah. I feel like that also happens when you practice religion, but you don't agree with everything that religious people want to pass. Because, like, for example, I was raised Catholic, but I believe in gay rights and I believe in a woman's right to choose what happens to her body. But every time I have this conversation with members of my family that are, like, com- like really extremely religious, the first thing they do is call me a bad Catholic, you know, because I oh, believe in common sense, (laughs) you know, on top of whatever I believe religiously. Given the fact that our generation, the millennial generation, is the least religious of any previous generations, can you see a time where society is not leaning towards Judeo-Christian ideals? It's it's so hard for me to see that because it is so they're so pervasive throughout our American culture, American politics. Um, so so it's hard for me to imagine. But at the same time, I think a lot of people are moving towards a sort of more of like a spirituality outlook rather than a specific God or religion, and that maybe would you know that might help um, bring us there. Uh, but I think that it's really um, I think it'd be very hard to to turn back centuries of like the sort of disrespect um, of other religions. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but if that's the right words I want to use. But uh, the sort of idea that you know that they that we are better, and um, so this gives us justification for doing things like slavery or manifest destiny or uh, colonialism. So, um, you know, it's very, um, you know, that's been around for hundreds of years. So thousands of years, but um, so it's hard to, uh, it's it's hard, it's hard to imagine being able to break that cycle. And we see it now, right? With the Trump supporters that the idea there, the idea that they might lose power, lose control is threatening. And that's, part of the reason why it had so much of this white supremacy and Protestant pride kind of Christian Oni um, mm-hmm. backlash. So, so I think it'd be hard to get away from, from that backlash. Yeah. I see where you're coming from. So do you think that even as a generation, like even let's say that as a generation, we largely, arrived at a point where we were pretty much renouncing organized religion. But do you, but it sounds like you think that the lessons that came as a result of that religion are kind of going to be ingrained. So even if we're not doing X, Y, or Z in the name of God or Jesus, we might continue doing those things in the name of something else? I think that as people, I would like to, I hope it would be different, but I think as, as a society, we're always going to 
be looking for the other. And so some way or another, someone is going to be sort of you know, subjugated or on it considered inferior mm -hmm. or set against whatever those values are at the time. So suppose it's time we become less religious and now the less religious people are um, showing, showing bias and hate towards people who are still really religious. Um, mm -hmm. Will we ever, you know, will we ever break away from that cycle? Not human beings. We always fuck stuff up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Um. Um, but kind of going back to the idea of Judeo-Christian imagery. So there's a ton of Judeo-Christian imagery and language everywhere in the U.S., so thinking about our Pledge of Allegiance, our money, the ending of every political speech, um, swearing legal oaths on Bibles, <laughs> etc. Um, so as a secular nation, should we prioritize ending this practice? Or are there bigger fish to fry in terms of the direct impact on our laws? Um, I, I can see why we might think there's bigger fish to, fish to fry. And, and there might be. But I think like what I was saying before, where these ideas are so ingrained that without changing them, we might not be able to get far, very far in other topics such as um, equal rights for, like, completely equal, you know, rights for women, for people of color. God or the divine is mentioned at least once in every state constitution in all, in all the, the 50 states. Um, and, you know, like, I think you guys have mentioned it on the show, on the show before that, uh, in God We Trust, replacing E Pluribus Unum was only implemented um, after a law in 1957 by Eisenhower. Under God was added to the pledge in 54, 1954. And I, you know, I just want to highlight that, that we replaced from many, one from many or from many one within God We Trust. So, you know, it's like replacing this diversity slogan with this sort of exclusive slogan. Mm -hmm. um, so they're very, you know, they're very new and it, it goes back to just the same time when they were coming up with this sort of Judeo Christian identity that they were also adding God and references to God into, into politics. Yeah. And I mean, I personally don't think <clears throat> this is ever going to change. There's way too much support for things like, well, I should say the debate is way too heated over things like abortion. Just from that, we can gleam how any other debate <laughs> over Judeo-Christian ideals would go right. in our country. Um, and I guess a final question just for the panel at large. Um, do any of us omit to do things like include the phrase under God when we're saying the pledge? I don't say under God when I'm saying, saying the pledge. No, I, I, a lot of that makes me very uncomfortable. Like when, even when someone says like, you know, have a blessed day. Like uh, it just, or you know, ends the speech with like "bless you." I'm like, it makes me uncomfortable. And I, I had a friend who suddenly became very religious back in high school, and um, I personally would have to say it's because, uh, in my opinion, it was because of a guy, <laughs> and she started going to church more um, because he was going to church more. Um, and so one, t and one time she said to me, you know, well, I. I'm, you know, I'm praying for you. And I'm like, why, why are you praying for me? She said, well, we pray for everyone that they will, you know, that they will receive the word of God. And I was just like, don't, don't pray for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think that just kind of, it just makes me very uncomfortable. And um, just, just to, just to feel like I'm being sort of like patronized or condescended to. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. I, stopped saying under God in the Pledge of Allegiance in high school because I was like, I'm not under that shit. <laughs> I said it because it's just the script. I just didn't think about it one way or I the other. I think I'm with you there. Although, again, having been raised Roman Catholic, it doesn't bother me. But it also alternatively does not bother me if you don't want to say it. So yes. I think that that's like a really big distinction that a lot of people fail to make it's just like just because you're religious and there's levels of like how religious people are even like in terms of christianity doesn't mean that everybody needs to adhere 
to what you practice, because if you really believe what you practice, then then you should know that you're not equipped to judge other people. And there's only one power that right. can judge other people. So, right. And then, so Roshni, something we said at the beginning of the show is we're asking those who co-host the show with us, tell us what you disagree with us on. And just, we don't have to get into this, but but you disagree with us um, on the cost of weddings. I, th- I I think what happened was maybe Laura and I, we were like, oh, if we ever get married, it'll just be a little thing, won't be a big deal. But are you arguing that that's impossible to do, keep it cheap? I don't know if I'd say it's impossible, but it's hard i mean Mm -hmm. yeah you could maybe have like 20 people in your backyard with the cake from Shoprite or whatever is a good local (laughs) thing for you but Shoprite here makes really good cakes but um yeah you know and and then yeah it'll it'll be cheap but like things like like one of the venues that i had looked at we need to get a tent the tent was ten thousand dollars so like right there your tent like it's like crap (laughs) and then you know flowers if you want fresh flowers if, if you want fake flowers that's going to cost you some money um mm-hmm. you know you can do e-cards e-invites and that'll save you some money um but there's like small things that you know like you don't think like a lot of people are like oh i just want to have it at a barn some of those places are like more expensive than the venue, <laughs> the venue that we chose so you know it looks yeah. all rustic but it's actually ridiculously um ridiculously pricey and then i think another thing i said to you is that sometimes you don't think about the logistics like you could have it in the backyard but is your plumbing equipped to accommodate that many people like if like do you have enough bathrooms do you want people going upstairs to your bathroom depending on how many people you have and so i think you know we can all kind of say like we want cheap weddings but in in reality it just it adds up really fast yeah I'm sensing a business opportunity here. At first, I was going to say, Laura, you and I can put together like a cheap wedding biz where we just like <laughs> send you a bunch of shit you can use. But now I'm thinking we just write a book on how to do it. And we'll have ideas like go to the bar, but first go behind the bar, clip some weeds and scatter them <laughs> around the bar floor. It'll create a lovely decor. I will for say your it guests. also helps if you have a small family slash circle of chosen family like i know if i ever get married and i do anything i'm gonna have to put in a shitload of money for it because my family's really big (laughs) and we don't do things halfway so no yeah no neither neither do we i mean i had just under 250 people at my wedding and for an indian wedding that is small see my family is mexican (laughs) and just for my quinceanera it was like probably close to ten thousand dollars yeah see uh, most of my extended family won't be invited to mine. <laughs> I'm thinking about doing that myself. I don't want them I'm there. just going to start cutting people off now. And then, and then you yeah. know what's going to happen? They're all going to be like angry about it and I'll hear about it on Facebook, but maybe by then I'll have deleted my Facebook. So it'll be fine. <laughs> See yeah, all the yeah. relatives that. that are going to be pissed at me. I've defriended. So <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. Mexican culture. Grandma's going to call you and be like, Hey, why did you defriend your Tia? Go at her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sa- same thing. Like, I mean, maybe not adding on Facebook, although a lot of my family has added me and I won't, I just won't like respond to the, yeah. to the um, request, especially before I was married because my husband is white and I really didn't want like second cousins and like extended family in India looking at my profile and judging me <laughs> on this. Uh, right. So I was just like, nope, you really don't need to know what's going on in my life. Plus, yeah. Indians tend to be on the more conservative side a lot of times. Um, and, you know, I post a lot of like liberal uh, news links and rants that my mom's always yelling at me for. <laughs> so I didn't want to get into that either. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Roshni, for sharing those thoughts. That was interesting to hear. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. For for hearing them out. Yes. <laughs> for not being like, oh, you're so racist, God, go away. <laughs> uh, what? Hell no. <laughs> well, you know, if you don't support Israel, you, you get called anti-Semitic a lot. So. No, geez. <laughs> well, th- yeah. evidently, that's what we're doing here on the show. We're, uh, we're adding more controversial opinions to the program. 
I think well, it's entirely possible to recognize that there are legitimate claims on both sides of that debate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, you know? I think at this point, you really can't, you know, you, 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 you can't just kick either of them out, you know, so like it, mm. at this point, it wouldn't be fair to kick the Jewish people out of Israel either. But yeah. So we have a new story to talk about today before we get to the confessional. Um, there's one man who's in the headlines this week more than any other, including Donald Trump. That is kind of a Donald Trump associate, Alex Jones. He is the far right conspiracy theorist who uh, has podcasts and a talk show and he spews all this stuff he has said some awful things about sandy hook in the past other shootings like the las vegas massacre um so he takes these wild opinions and he just throws them out there on his podcast on facebook on youtube and all of these social media giants have until this week just been like hey man free speech you can do what i want blah 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 Um, But then over the past couple of weeks, a couple of his most hateful episodes, and he's not only spewing lies, but just hateful language about human beings. A couple of those episodes were pulled from Spotify. And now, over the weekend, Apple took one of the strongest steps yet. They have pulled completely his podcasts from the iTunes store. He has six episodes. They left up just one of them. Um, it was the biggest move by a tech company against wild conspiracy theories and hateful language online. I mean, a lot of this stuff has gone unchecked. And Alex Jones is easily the biggest biggest conspiracy theorist out there. Um, he has said that the, the people and children involved in these shootings are actors. Just terrible stuff to say. And his supporters follow him. Um, so Apple led the charge here, got rid of all of his podcasts. Spotify then followed up, removed all of his, as did Facebook, removed Alex Jones's Facebook pages, um, and YouTube has now removed his channel. That was all in one day. Everybody was dragging their ass for years after this guy was spewing all this hateful shit. Then Apple, to their credit, took a stand and said, no, this is bullshit, goodbye. And then all the others followed. Followed along so quick. Um, All he's got left now to get his message out is Twitter and Periscope. But to lose to lose Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. I mean, if you were subscribed to the podcast, you can't even access them anymore (laughs) through the Apple Podcast app. So he's he's he got hit today, and rightfully so. Um, Unfortunately, though. This is only going to embolden his supporters, right? And Alex knows he can use this to rev up his base. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a similar effect to when Milo Yiannopoulos got banned off Twitter and a couple of other social platforms. Mm -hmm. Um, That said, his career did peak a little bit after that, but then he got kicked off Breitbart for making jokes about, you know, pedophilic priests and things like that. So maybe something similar will happen to Alex Jones. Yeah. Um, I can't like I know we talked about this just a couple weeks ago on the show. And I remember at the time saying, I don't necessarily think that Alex Jones should be kicked off Facebook. I think that Facebook should label him as fake news, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, seeing that he's being kicked off, I don't feel sorry for him. Yeah. You know, Facebook's yeah. a private company. They can do what they want. How I agree. Was he, um, how was his show being broadcast? Was it was it only online? Because I I've, I've seen a, a bit of it, but was there is it not on any like TV network? Like as far as French? I can tell, it is only online. Yeah, but to lose YouTube and Facebook, I mean, these are giants. This is how yeah. people consumed him. So he's going to have to figure out how to get his videos out there. Um, I'm sure he'll figure it out because he's making money off of this. And when you look at all the horrible shit that gets to be on Facebook and YouTube to get kicked off, you have to be pretty fucking bad. I was going to say, I'm actually kind of more curious to see how this sets a precedent to other things that people have been clamoring for removal of. Um, And there's definitely like YouTube is like a cesspool for uh, content that really um, has been violating guidelines. And I know they did a big AdSense revamp. So those people 
can no longer make money from their hate speech, but it's still not the same as just pulling the content yeah. all together. So. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what kind of line will be drawn now. I think, can we just set the bar at Alex Jones and anything just as bad or worse than him? Just yeah. pull this shit. Do you think it's a slippery slope? Like, you know, what's it done be. to go from, like, Alex Jones to the, like, you know, the tides turning and things slipping and now we're um, banning speak about, I don't know, Islam. <laughs> like, not, you know, Islam is islamic terrorists but just like the religion or yeah um something else i don't know very liberal. yeah <laughs> it's possible and that debate is certainly going to come up and i'm sure donald trump is probably going to tweet something about this how dare they take down this guy who uh said the sandy hook shooting was was faked how dare they um, I did find a tribute video to Alex Jones on Twitter that was very <laughs> touching. So to wrap this up, I thought I would just play that. I will remember you. We are gay reptoid space alien lovers. Ah! We know we're under attack. We know it. We're breaking the conditioning. Magellan's a lot cooler than Justin Bieber. You little kids like to go to movies and see some drug addict hippie acting tough and acting scary. <laughs> yes, Obama is the Antichrist. <laughs> Farewell, Alex, for now. Uh, Have you ever watched any of his, like, shows or um, anything? No. I've seen a little bit. He he would go like eight or nine hours, and, and like the guy needs to be medicated or something. Like, I'm I, very I <laughs> sorry to hear that you've watched him before. Well, <laughs> watch the, watch the part sells, of it, you know. Mm-hmm. He sells so many vitamin supplements. Yeah, <laughs> that's. I yeah. wonder if that's his problem. Yeah. All right, so we have some great recommendations to give everybody this week. But first, we have a final sponsor. They are Policy Genius. We've told you about them before. They are the go to place for anyone searching for insurance policies of all types. You know what type you can find there? Life insurance. But it can be confusing, which may explain why four out of 10 people don't have it yet. Maybe you're one of those people. Don't be that person. If anything were to happen to you, it's important that your loved ones are taken care of. Besides, life insurance rates are actually at the lowest they've been in 20 years. I've looked for my own life insurance policy on here, and I, I can believe it. Uh, they are cheap. I was genuinely surprised, so, uh, so I applied for a policy. Policy Genius is the way to quickly and easily compare quotes from the top insurers to find the best policy for you. And that's the genius of it. One simple site to go to to find the best rates for all insurance policies. All you got to do is visit the site, click the type of policy you're looking for, and it'll ask you a couple questions about what you're trying to insure. Then boom, you're given a bunch of policy options from all the insurers that you can trust. In fact, they've helped over 4 million people shop for insurance and placed over $20 billion in coverage. Don't let insurance shopping suck anymore. Use these guys. Make it quick and easy. If you need life insurance, but you've been putting it off because it's too confusing or you don't have time, check out Policy Genius. Go to policygenius.com, get quotes, and apply in minutes. It's that easy. You can do it right now, and you should, because like I said, rates are at their lowest in 20 years. Policy Genius, the easy way to compare and buy life insurance. Okie dokie. So I think we've got a bunch of recommendations. Laura, what is your recommendation this week? My recommendation is a friendly reminder to everybody to check your credit report every now and then. Um... Nowadays, it seems like most banks and credit card companies have this automatically built into your account. So you can check for kind of a generalized perception of what your credit score is. Of course, there are three credit bureaus. So you may want to pull a report once a year from all three of those. Uh, The reason I recommend this is because Although it's not fun, it can help you keep track of really important things. Something that I discussed on the show several times is that I was the victim of credit fraud in 2011, and I am happy to say that I checked my credit report the other day, and it has finally fallen off, Yay. and my credit score jumped 70 points. 
Wow. Oh, just holy from crap. that. What's so, your number, baby? You got to well, give it to us? I'm not going to tell you that. Oh. <laughs> I'm much happier with it now, though. Well, that's good. Yeah. So definitely a good thing to keep an eye on. If for no other reason, then you want to be able to see uh, when new cards have been opened, if you have balance increases, anything like that. Because um, it can be really easy, especially with the amount of credit fraud happening right now, just between like cards getting picked up on the dark web. Um, also just leaving like r- random receipts out at restaurants, which we've talked about Ooh. definitely tearing those up and not leaving them on the table before. It can be really easy to have your identity stolen. So keep an eye on this. You can also pay a monthly subscription fee to any of the three credit bureaus. There are also a number of independent agencies out there that will pull all three credit reports for you and update you mm. on a monthly basis. So you can stay on top of that. It's good to know. I'm going to look into that. Mm-hmm. Pam, what's your rec? Oh, my rec is the movie Eighth Grade, which was written and directed by comedian Bo Burnham, who gained notoriety on YouTube. He's really great. He's got a couple uh, stand-up specials on YouTube as well, if you're unfamiliar and you want to check those out. This movie is so, so good. It centers on a girl who is trying to survive her last two weeks of eighth grade before she goes into high school and deals with a lot of issues that I think all of us can relate to or have been able to relate to at some point, including being a little bit shy and introverted, feeling like you don't have any friends, uh, the pressure to fit in and stand out and also uh, deals a little bit with anxiety as well. And it um, also kind of through the course of the movie, uh, you see... Um, how the pressure of social media and being active on things like Snapchat and Instagram and uh, YouTube kind of put extra pressure on kids growing up, especially today to, um, you know, fit in and, and kind of like perform on that level as well. So, yeah, cool. My recommendations, first of all, something that everybody can pretty easily watch, Sharp Objects. This is a drama airing on HBO right now. It's a great summer show. It's set in Missouri, I think. Um, it's set during the summer, I believe. It stars Amy Adams. It's based on the book by Gillian Flynn of the same name. Uh, sorry, it's, <laughs> it's based on the book by Gillian Flynn. She is the same author who wrote Gone Girl. And of course, that was a very popular and very good movie. I also mentioned that my mom and aunt visited. We went on the Chicago Architecture Tour. And this is one of those tours that's on a boat. And it goes through uh, the Chicago River right through the heart of the city. And it was magnificent. It was so much fun. Not very expensive. They give you a great informational tour. You just sit there on the boat and you take in the sights and you take in this interesting information. Pat went with us. We all had a great time. There's a bar on the boat, which I thought was a fun surprise, along with bathrooms if you drink too much. And um, it's like sitting in a moving theater. That's how I took it, because it's this giant boat, and you're just sitting there looking up, just watching the spectacle before you. Laura, if you end up coming out here, uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend. Okay. I'll yeah. keep it in mind. Mm. That wasn't as uh, sure of an answer as I thought, but that's okay. <laughs> um, Roshni, do you have any recommendations? Um, sure. I, I recommend Upstate New York, because it's the best, <laughs> and... Um, I recommend listening to the music of uh, an artist called A.D. The Voice. Um, So up here in New York, there's a very uh, contentious congressional uh, race in um, District 21 with a guy named John Fassa, who's a piece of shit, (laughs) you know, in in professional opinion. Um, And uh, the the new uh, challenger, whose name is Anton, and Anthony Delgado, and uh, he used to be a rapper. Anthony Delgado he used to be a rapper. He also graduated from Harvard Law as like a Rhodes Scholar. But Faso keeps um, harping on the fact that he was he used uh, curses and the N word in his uh, rap song. So I suggest going and listening to them. They're actually really good. Most people don't uh, haven't actually listened. They're just reading the news reports. So. Yep. Yeah. AD the voice. Okay. Cool, cool. I'll play one of their songs in the outro today. Roshni, thanks for joining us. Hope you had a good time today. I did. Thank you so much for having me. Hope I, I did okay as the first one. You did. Our inaugural co-host, listener. It went very well. It was a pleasure hearing from you. 
uh, that is one of our benefits over at patreon.com slash millennial. By supporting us at various levels, you'll have access to different benefits, include listening live, video blogs to talk about stuff we ha- didn't have time to talk about in the main show, release bonus audio, we have a voicemail line, and of course, After Dark. And today we're talking about social media norms that need to end. This is going to be a fun one. And um, since it is the first After Dark of the month, it is going to be available to patrons at our Friends with Benefits level as well. So we hope you enjoy that. And also just wanted to give a quick plug for something we have coming up later this month. Actress and creator Mariana Novak will be joining us to talk about the pros and cons of breaking into the industry, as well as provide some insight about the kinds of things that you can run into being a woman. Uh, It's going to be a really, really interesting discussion. We've already talked a lot about this behind the scenes. So I'm really looking forward to having her on. Cool. Same. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks again, Roshni. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. I'm Pamela. And I'm Roshni. Bye. 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 I'm scared, TK. They ain't ready. Uh, yeah. Now let me tell you why I do this here. No rhyme to my reason, but I see things clear. Got a gift in between these ears. Yeah, I hear time ticking, but it's not in my essence. The sun mix in my presence. Ice evaporates into effervescence. Been here before and after your adolescence. And I always will. Not hard to kill. But I'll never die from which shall else no supplies. Monopolize the men that supply. Mystify the mystifying materialize the wish you I am. In hip hop terms, shit is still mad. Beyond a reason for doubt, the flow got clout. Like find the blueprint inside of the lost tapes. You live in check to check. This again is checkmate. My formula. Nines was J's and times 50. Throwing some pop with a little bit of beat. Come on.